The purpose of this lecture is to compare and contrast the morphology of the maxillary and mandibular anterior teeth. This will include the maxillary and mandibular centrals, lateral incisors, and canines. The student learning objectives for this lecture are to describe and identify permanent anterior teeth based on eruption sequence, coronal, coronal anatomy, root anatomy, and pulp anatomy using various tooth numbering systems. Evaluate restorations to determine what changes are necessary to assure harmony with the adjacent structures and the occlusion, and to apply dental anatomy nomenclature when identifying and describing teeth, restorations, and supporting tissues. So as we look at this top slide, we see the maxillary anterior teeth have been prepared to receive porcelain jacket crowns. And these are the laboratory version of the jacket crowns here that you can see in the lower picture. And I would like you to have a look at the teeth in this lower slide here and tell me whether you think that these are ideal anatomical representations of the, of the anterior teeth. Um, I would say they're pretty good, um, but I would think that there may be some features on these teeth that uh, could be improved. The purpose of this lecture is, is to show you the very, very specific nature of dentistry and why all of these anatomical features are important for you to understand to become an excellent aesthetic general dentist. So the purpose of this lecture is to compare and contrast the individual teeth. Um, there are a lot of features of the teeth that we are not going to be able to uh, specifically mention in a one hour or so lecture. So uh, I have to leave it up to you to do some reading in your Wheeler's textbook uh, and learn some of these features. Uh, just It's just going to be memorization. It's just plain work. That's all there is to it. And all of this information, as you see here, the Wheeler's book has uh, tables and charts that help you uh, um, study for your national board exams and to get through the exams in this course. And there is just a lot of information that you have to know. You have to know mesial distal widths. You have to know general sizes. You have to have locations of the proximal contacts are always going to be very important. And your understanding of the Let's say the mesial contact of the central incisor is in the incisal one-third. This is a very important feature of this tooth. And it distinguishes itself from the other incisors because of that trait. Um, all of these the information that you see here is material that you just basically have to, to start studying and start memorizing. And these charts, and if you go on to your Evolve website uh, that's associated with the book, there are flashcards and things like that that can help you um, memorize this material. The other thing that I will tell you is, is that being able to draw the teeth uh, while you have some off time, pick up a pencil on a napkin and start you know, drawing teeth. If you can draw the teeth and reiterate the various features of the tooth, then you know what you're doing with it, and that's good. So from your readings in the Wheeler's textbook, you can see that we have a natural tooth on a grid. These are one millimeter grids here, so that helps you see where heights of contour and where various contours, concavities, how convexities are on the tooth. Um, you can see here that the we just mentioned the height of contour, or the incisal contact on the mesial is in the incisal one-third. So if we take the tooth and we divide the crown of the tooth into an incisal one-third, a middle one-third, and a cervical one-third. Uh, there are differences in the heights of contour that you just need to understand. So if we compare the height of contour, which in this case is the line, if I draw a straight line down the tooth, down the long axis, where the contact or where the uh, tooth touches, that's the highest spot on the tooth here on the mesial, is in the incisal one-third. If I look at the distal surface, it's kind of down here, isn't it? 
it's a little bit more at the junction of the incisal and middle one-thirds on that tooth. So as we go around and, and think about different contours and that, think about dividing the tooth into thirds, the crowns, or the roots um, as we go along here, and then that will help you break the tooth down into various sections that, that we can see. Again, being able to draw a simple outline form with these features uh, is going to be important for, for you to develop the proper understanding that you're going to need to wax these teeth, which is what you're going to do in the laboratory here soon. Along with knowing just the basic contours of each permanent and then later on primary tooth uh, as you're studying for dental anatomy, be aware that uh, we will also be requiring you to memorize the eruption age uh, or eruption sequences of the teeth as they come forward. So central incisors are erupted usually around seven to eight, mandibular incisors, uh, central incisors six to seven years, lateral incisors are eight to nine, mandibular incisors uh, seven to eight, and canines 11 to 12, mandibular canines nine to 10. Also, you're going to need to know the mesiodistal crown diameters of all of the permanent teeth, um, which will be not too hard to memorize, really, if you look here at the maxillary incisors. Uh, the lateral incisor is 6.5 millimeters. That's at the height of contour, which, of course, on the crown is corresponds to the interproximal contact area. So lateral incisor is 6.5 canines are 7.5 and then of course the maxillary central incisor is very wide of all of the incisors and it's 8.5 millimeters. In the mandibular arch the central is 5, it's just the smallest tooth isn't it? Lateral incisor is 5.5 and the canine is 7. So again as you're studying these teeth keep the various contours in mind, keep the eruption sequence in mind, and also the mesiodistal crown diameters as well as the general shape and sizes of the teeth as compared to each other. So as we look at slides like this, this is a nice opportunity for us to memorize and start practicing our tooth numbering system. So if we remember the canines being 6, 11, 22, and 27, as Dr. Chung had mentioned, we know now that this is tooth number 11. And as we look at this diagram up here at the top, this is my idea of being able to draw the teeth. So if you can doodle and draw these teeth in this kind of an outline form, it's a very good thing for you to do and it's a good practice. What I'm trying to do is to have you develop a um, concept when, of what an ideal tooth is, is going to look like. And this comes with practice. So you have to be able to visualize what the tooth is going to look like before you can wax it or restore it. So let's say if the mesial incisal angle on this, tooth, on this central incisor number nine has been fractured off, you have to have a concept in your mind of how you're going to rebuild that tooth to the natural tooth structure that comes in. And you'll get practice of this in, in operative dentistry and stuff. In dental anatomy, we're going to use wax to help you build this concept. You're also going to need to understand that uh, you can draw these teeth, and I would recommend that you practice that right now. So remember, our central incisor is going to be the widest tooth of all of the anterior teeth. It's going to be 8.5 millimeters, usually. It has an interproximal contact area that is in the incisal one-third. You will know from your criteria that this mesial incisal angle really needs to be 90 degrees to the tooth long axis. And that's really, really important. You'll see that as we go to the lateral incisor, that's more rounded and then even more rounded still for the canine. So that 90 degree mesial incisal angle is something that you have to understand and be able to visualize and memorize, basically. So this is a fairly flat tooth. It's not a chiclet, okay? It doesn't look like a piano key when you're done. There are contours. This is a convex surface. This is more flat, and you'll see as we look at these in various views. So let's say this is a labial view or a facial view. Um, you will see different characteristics as we go. One of the concepts that Dr. Chung talked to you about earlier is the concept of embrasure. Uh, 
and that is the V-shaped space that emanates from an interproximal contact. And we like to teach the concept that the, the embrasures are mirror image. So if I draw a line right down the center of the embrasure here, this side of the embrasure here would be the same as the, or a mirror image of the, the distal side of the, the embrasure. So as we look, you can see in this view, the facial view, that we have an incisal embrasure and now we have a gingival embrasure. So of the four embrasures that are formed from an interproximal contact, you can see from a facial view, you can see two of them, which is the incisal embrasure and the gingival embrasure. And again, in an ideal tooth form, what we would like to see is that each embrasure is a mirror image of the other side. So if we look here, maybe not quite as apparent, but if we can make that as close to a mirror image, each side of the embrasure as possible, you're going to have a better relationship um, when you're waxing and, and restoring your teeth. Looking at this slide, we can see again another uh, rendition of the facial view. You can see that as we talked about embrasures and interproximal contacts, if we look, there's a phenomenon that goes from the midline, from the mesial surface, that the incisal embrasures and the interproximal contacts tend to get a little bit more cervical as we move distally or back further in the mouth. So what that does then is that leaves the central incisor, the embrasure between the central incisor being the smallest, and then between the central and the lateral incisor being a little bigger, and then of course this between the lateral incisor and the canine being a little even bigger than that. Um, and we also see that the interproximal contact location becomes lower or more cervical as we move distally in the mouth. So incisal one-third, junction of incisal and middle one-thirds here, um, junction of incisal and middle to middle as we go down the, the tooth structure. Um, there is another concept that we need to talk about, which are line angles. And you know from Dr. Chung's lecture that a line angle is where two surfaces of the teeth meet. This is important that you understand this concept because it is how we charge, basically, for fillings and restorations, um, whether by surface. So if we have a restoration that incorporates two surfaces, we charge more for those restorations than a restoration that's just on one surface. So the line angles that we're referring to here are... Um, it's an imaginary line, but if you think about it, it's where the mesial surface and the labial surface come together. So line angles are not always apparent. They are a lot more rounded here at the cervical area of the tooth than they are up at the incisal edge. But if we look at the mesial incisal line angle here on the lateral incisor uh, and here on the cuspid, this would be where the two surfaces come together, the mesial and the labial surface come together. We'll look at this again in the incisal view of the teeth, and I think maybe it'll help you visualize what we're talking about better. So if we have mesiofacial line angles on the previous slide, this slide indicates the distofacial line angles on these and the anterior teeth. Um, the distofacial line angles separate the distal surface from the facial surface. Again, they are more distinct towards the incisal edges of the teeth, and as we get more cervically, they are more rounded. You'll also note that there are differences in, in terms of the uh, shape of the teeth. And so if we look at the distal of this cuspid, you can see that this area below the interproximal contact area is concave. Uh, if we look at the lateral incisor, the area that is con corresponds to the distal contact area is convex. So um, as you're studying the teeth, Pay attention to uh, the convexities or the uh, concavities that may be uh, illustrated in the various views. So now we're looking at an incisal view of actual extracted teeth. 
and you can see the central, the lateral incisor, and the canine. From this view, now we can see the other two embrasures, which are, of course, the facial embrasure and the lingual embrasure. So as we've discussed previously, there are four embrasures that come emanate from an interproximal contact. A facial and lingual embrasure is seen here, and then previously we reviewed the incisal and gingival embrasure. Again, as you can see here, the contact areas are almost down the center of the tooth. If I look in, in, the, in the tooth, um, the contact areas on these central incisors and on the laterals are pretty close to being right in the center of the mass of structure. The line angles that you can see, let's say here, we have a distofacial line angle uh, again, and a mesiofacial line angle here on this cuspid. As you can see, um, they require a little bit of imagination sometimes to visualize. They are much more apparent, usually in the incisal portions of the tooth, than as we go down into the cervical areas of the tooth, they become more rounded and harder to visualize. But beware that you need to have a firm understanding of where the line angles are uh, when you are doing restorative dentistry. So you appropriately identify the uh, surfaces of the tooth that your restoration encompasses. So this slide is a reminder that teeth are not piano keys or chiclets. They do have contours and individual features that need to be replicated if you're really going to be a great aesthetic dentist. So most incisors, at least the permanent incisors, that are not such a feature of primary incisors, will have labial developmental depressions. And you can see uh, Dr. Chung talked to you about the concept of a lobe and that how every tooth has at least four lobes. Some teeth have five. But this is the lobe feature of a incisor, there's a mesial lobe, a distal lobe, and a central lobe. Um, and there are breaks in the enamel too. So if we look here in the cervical third, there may be some uh, imbrication lines, just very, very fine lines. We have extracted teeth for you to review and to look at, so you should look at these. Some teeth, these features are very strong, some features they're not. Um, but they are there and they break the surface of the tooth up. Your understanding of labial developmental depressions and imbrication lines uh, in your wax ups will make the difference between a tooth that looks natural and reflects light the way it should against the natural teeth on either side of the restoration versus something that really stands out and does not really look like a, an appropriate tooth. Here we're looking at the lingual surfaces of natural extracted teeth. And as you can see, there really isn't a lot to talk about. Most teeth will have the fourth lobe is a cingulum in the anterior, and this would be the cingulum here on this tooth, this would be the cingulum here on this tooth, and then there, of course, there are mesial and distal marginal ridges, and usually a concave area here, which would be the lingual fossa of the tooth. Um, most incisor, especially on the maxillary, will have a facial incisal edge and then a lingual incisal edge as the teeth uh, erupt and then become worn as they go. But we'll go to the next slide now to look at some of the other basic features of, of the teeth. So in this slide, we can look at the lingual surface. Um, in the line drawing area. Again, you can see the cingulum is delineated here pretty cool out pretty well. There may be a lingual developmental fissure or a pit in these teeth that may be present. This would be the lingual fossa relationship, the mesial marginal ridge, the distal marginal ridge, the lingual cemento enamel junction, as you can see, uh, and then, of course, the, the, the developmental um, incisal edge as it, as it wears in, forming a lingual incisal edge and also a facial incisal edge. Okay, here's a quiz. What tooth number do we have here? This would be the right maxillary central incisor or tooth number eight. How do we know that? 
Well, we look at the incisal edge and we look at the shape of the tooth. You can see that the lingual cingulum, as you can see here, has an access to it. And so if we look at the incisal edge, the cingulum kind of tends to point distally when we look at it from an incisal view. So this help, helps to identify the more rounder surface here as the distal surface of the crown. This is the mesial surface. This is a nice rendition of the lobe form of the tooth where you also will see um, contours that remember are developmental depressions that are shown from the incisal view as well as the mass of the cingulum here kind of pointing right off to the distal so that helps us identify which tooth that is. Going back to our doodle drawing here, let's look at the relationship of coronal dimensions between our anterior teeth, maxillary anteriors. And so we can see, remember, this is our widest tooth in the um, maxillary anterior region, the central incisor being 8.5. I would also like to feature that this tooth is wider mesiodistally than it is measured facial lingually. Again, here we're measuring from the height of contour or the highest part of the tooth. So this tooth, while being fairly symmetrical with the incisal edges and the interproximal contacts, is wider in a mesial distal dimension than in a facial lingual dimension. Uh, the same is true for the maxillary lateral incisor, where we have a wider mesial distal measurement than a labial lingual measurement. Most other teeth, are, that's not a true situation. Most teeth have, like this cuspid, will be wider in a facial lingual dimension than mesiodistally. But our maxillary central and lateral incisors, uh, permanent maxillary central and lateral incisors, are wider mesiodistally. Now let's spend some time looking at the roots and pulps of the anterior teeth. Here we have a maxillary central incisor, and if we look at the pulp cavity, which is this entire space occupied by the dental pulp, remember the dental pulp is formative, it's nutritious, uh, provides nutrition, it has innervation to it, it has reparative cells uh, that allows the tooth to function uh, throughout the lifetime. Uh, it actually, the, the shape of the pulp cavity follows the external outline form of the, of the tooth, so it's actually pretty easy to, to know. Uh, we have the root canal, which is this area occupied here by the root. The area that's within the pulp or within the, uh, the crown of the tooth is called the pulp chamber. And features of the pulp chamber are, what we, are sharp projections, depending on whether we're looking at it from a facial view or a proximal view uh, of uh, these uh, pulp horns that you see here, these little spikes in the pulp that represent the lobes of the teeth. So maxillary central incisors will often have three lobes or three pulp horns uh, versus maybe two pulp horns. Uh, the, the lateral incisor is not as prominent, maybe has two to one uh, pulp horn and the canine uh, possibly just one, one pulp horn. Uh, we'll look at this a lot more when we study chapter 13. Uh, and study each individual permanent tooth, the root, and the pulp. Uh, but for now, just be aware that if we section the root, we haven't talked much about the root form of the teeth yet, if we section the root and look at it from an incisal view, if you can use your imagination, this is being wider mesiodistally than facial lingually, uh, it actually kind of forms of what we call a triangular root form at the cervical root. Um, if we look at it in section. And the pulp chamber uh, is the same, it follows a, the, a kind of a triangular root form. As we go further down the root, uh, the root tends to be more oval and then as the pulp chamber or root canal also becomes more round as we look at it. So as you're looking at the teeth and studying these incisors, also have a look at the, the uh, pulpal characteristics and root form. The canines uh, will have proximal root depressions, and so oftentimes, along with the mandibular incisors, you will get this that looks like either a kidney bean or possibly a um, ribbon-shaped root. I'll try to do a little better drawing here. Ribbon-shaped root where you have proximal root depressions. Um, 
that can form like a figure eight maybe or or um, you know, what they call ribbon shaped root. Now let's look at our doodle chart for the mandibular anterior teeth. As you can see, they have similar features to the maxillary anterior uh, counterparts that we just discussed. Uh, one of the main differences is that the anatomy is usually a little bit less striking uh, in terms of the overall features of the mandibular incisors. But as we can see, the, in the concept of um, where the interproximal contacts are uh, slightly, you know, lowering towards the cervical area as you move from the midline to the distal uh, or more posterior areas. Um, the contact areas will be a little bit uh, lower uh, in, towards the cervical as we move distally. Uh, the mandibular central incisors, uh, our contact areas are both in the incisal one-third of the tooth. So if we look at the max, the mandibular central incisors between 24 and 25, you can see that they are basically very, very symmetrical. It's hard to tell the difference between the mandibular central incisors as to whether they're right or left. One feature that we will notice that the incisal edge is now slightly lingual to the long axis or the center of the tooth. Um, so there's a curvature there, so that is one difference. The mandibular central incisors are so symmetrical, in fact, that we won't ask you to tell the difference between 24 or 25 on the incisal, on the uh, tooth identification exam. So that's something that you do not have to do. You can tell me the tooth is either 24 or number 25 and this will be accepted. Lingual anatomy is very indistinct, very shallow fossa. The marginal ridges are not very well um, adapted or, or um, noticeable. Uh, so there really isn't a lot of feature to the mandibular anterior teeth that we need to funk, that we need to, to uh, tell you about. The mesiodistal dimension is smaller on all of these than the facial lingual dimension. So um, that is a characteristic as well. So they will be wider facial lingually than they are mesiodistally. When we move from the central incisors to the lateral incisors, now this, the symmetry is less, um, is, the, the tooth is more asymmetric, I guess, with the opposing uh, surfaces. If we look at the incisal edge, in fact, it'll be twisted on its axis along with the cingulum. So again, now between 23 and 26, um, the cingulum will point to the distal and the incisal edge versus the long axis of the tooth will be on opposite uh, or twisted. Uh, so it's very easy to tell the difference between a central and a lateral and then the lateral incisors between right and left. So those are distinctions that you'll have to make on the tooth identification test. We haven't discussed too much about um, the incisors uh, in terms of root other than we mentioned the triangular root form of the central incisor of the maxilla. But um, most of the anterior teeth are going to be single rooted and have a single pulp canal. Actually, the mandibular canines are oftentimes um, will have a feature that is a double root. So the root may be bifurcated on the mandibular canine. And so there are favorite national board exam questions that say, well, if there is a bifurcated root on an anterior tooth, which one is the most likely? And your answer to that would be, of course, the mandibular canine, uh, which may present with a facial and a lingual root and, as well as two canals. There may also be two canals in the central incisors of the mandible, but not two roots, usually two pulp canals or root canals. Uh, if the feature is going to be something other than a single. We will discuss this uh, in greater detail when we discuss roots and pulps in, in chapter 13. But for now, notice that most anterior teeth, maxillary or mandibular, will be single-rooted, with the exception of the mandibular canine being the most likely to have a bifurcation. 
So again, a little clearer view maybe of the labial view of the mandibular incisors. Uh, again, featuring the same uh, mirror image, very, very small uh, incisal embrasure between the central incisors. Uh, between the central and lateral, a little wider. Again, and a little wider between the lateral and the canine, much like the maxillary anterior teeth as well. Um, incisal embrasures um, becoming a little bit broader along with the interproximal context becoming a little more cervical as we move distally. The mandibular canine has a short mesial cusp arm versus a distal cusp arm, so you can identify that as well. And you'll see the mandibular canine oftentimes will have a very, very flat profile on the mesial surface. There may be some root curvature to it, but uh, as a characteristic, the mandibular canine is oftentimes very straight on the mesial surface. And if we look at it from the facial and lingual, so a proximal view, you'll see it's very curved, almost like a moon. Looking at the lingual view of the mandibular incisors, again, you can't really see too much in terms of anatomy, so pretty indistinct. The incisal view showing basically the same um, relationship between the mandibular central incisors and lateral incisors, the centrals of course being almost at right angles with each other and very symmetrical. The incisal edge to the cingulum axis being twisted on the lateral incisors. Again, all of these teeth have a labial lingual measurement greater than a mesial distal measurement. So this is a great slide showing a proximal view of mandibular incisors or anterior teeth. So the central, as you can see, the features that you need to note are the lingual or the incisal edge being lingual to the long axis of the tooth on both the mandibular central and the mandibular lateral. This is a feature that is not uh, mimicked in the maxillary anterior incisors uh, as the incisal edge is basically down the long axis of the tooth in both of the maxillary incisors. The mandibular incisors, as you can see, there is a nice curvature to the facial surface especially the semi-lunar curvature of the mandibular canine, as you see here, uh, being very rounded and distinct. There is another feature that, I will sh that we will point out that on the lingual surface of the CEJ of the mandibular incisors is a little bit lower cervically than the CEJ is on the facial surface. So that's something that can sometimes, and not so much on the canine, but on the mandibular central and lateral incisors, the CEJ is lower on the lingual by almost a millimeter than it is on the facial surface. So that, that and the incisal edge position down the long axis of the tooth will help you identify these teeth as mandibular incisors. Uh, looking in approximately, all anterior teeth um, will have a single pulp horn as viewed from the mesial or the distal. Uh, you can see that the widest portion of the pulp chamber uh, on all of these teeth is in the cervical one-third of the tooth right there. And so those are features uh, of the pulpal anatomy that you need to be aware of. Considering pulpal anatomy, looking at it from the facial form, um, you can see that the pulp chamber, pulp cavity, actually follows the basic anatomical features of the tooth. Uh, they may have one pulp horn, they may have one or two, uh, but along with the anatomical features of the crown of the teeth, these are not very distinct. Um, this is a nice feature of the showing the mandibular canine with a straight mesial surface and the mesial cusp arm being shorter than the distal cusp arm as we look and see. Interproximally, again, this shows the feature of the cingulum or the CEJ being a little lower uh, than the facial CEJ um, on the mandibular incisors. If we look at these teeth in cross-section, uh, and we cross-section the teeth uh, and look at it from an incisal view, uh, 
I don't have a slide of this, but we'll talk about it in great detail when we discuss tooth ID and in chapter 13. But oftentimes mandibular incisors will have what's called a uh, ribbon-shaped root when you look at it from the incisal view. Um, again, the mandibular incisors being very wide facial lingually, not so much mesial distally, but oftentimes the root of the mandibular incisors will have proximal depressions and will be oftentimes uh, what they call ribbon shaped. Um, this is especially true when we have teeth that are further down in the root and we end up with two pulp canals in them. So in general the outline form of the root form of the maxillary anterior teeth will be triangular in shape to oval and round for the lateral incisor to on the mandibular incisor to this figure eight or ribbon shaped root um, with the canines both maxillary and mandibular having possible proximal root depressions as well if a tooth an anterior tooth is going to have a proximal root depression it will be on the mesial or the distal surfaces of the teeth. We will use this diagram once again to illustrate a couple of final points here uh, regarding heights of contour and uh, relationships of the teeth. If we look at this facial um, diagram and we talked about heights of contour both on the maxillary incisors and in the mandibular incisors or anterior teeth, we recognize that the height of contour of the crown, looking at this on the facial dimension, is in the incisal one-third of the crown of the tooth right here. Um, on the distal surface, if we do the same thing and we strike a line down the long axis of the tooth, the very widest part of the tooth and this mandibular incisor is again at the incisal one-third of the crown of the tooth. Uh, that means that this is the part where you measure as the widest part. If we look at the height of contour on a canine, we have a relationship where the incisal uh, mesial contact would be a little bit lower, right? Maybe at the, the junction of the incisal and middle one-thirds here. And again, on the distal surface, the height of contour is in the middle one-third of the tooth uh, or in the middle one-third of the crown of the tooth. When we look at the tooth from the, a proximal view, there is a height of contour as well. From the facial view, we see that the height of contour corresponds to the location of the interproximal contacts. So the height of contours on the crown of the, the crowns of the teeth, as viewed from the facial or the lingual, correspond to the interproximal contacts. If we strike a um, long axis line on the lingual surface of anterior teeth, you will see that the height of contour on the crown of the tooth is, is located in the, the cervical one-third of the tooth. The same is true for the facial view. So when I see that at the widest part of the crown of the tooth, or the widest part of this tooth, is at the height of contour, and that corresponds to the cervical one-third of the crown when we view it from the proximal view. This is true for all maxillary and mandibular anterior teeth. The heights of contour, when viewed from the facial, correspond to the location of the interproximal contacts. The heights of contour on the facial and lingual surfaces of the teeth are located in the cervical one-third of, of the crown. Another feature that you can see from a proximal view that I didn't mention earlier is as we have a contact area, interproximally, as I'm drawing here, there is a curvature of the cemento-enamel junction, or the CEJ, that corresponds to the height or the location of the interproximal contact. So in general, if an interproximal contact is higher up on the tooth or up in the incisal one-third of the tooth, the curvature of the CEJ will be greater on that surface as the contact area is moved distal, as we contact area is moved more cervically or go down inside the tooth, um, as we go distally, the 
curvature of the CEJ becomes less. So please have a look at that also in your Wheeler's book and understand that that concept, that the curvature of the CEJ on the crowns of anterior teeth tend to follow the same tendency as the height of contour or the location of the interproximal contacts are on the mesial and the distal surfaces. Okay, so now that you've been studying maxillary and mandibular anterior teeth, tell me what do you think? Are these ideal forms of the teeth that we see here in these crowns that are formed? And what do you think the most striking uh, feature is on the teeth? I see that these teeth have nice root depression or nice developmental depressions and so the surface is reflecting light. It's not just a chiclet or a, a piano key that we see here. There may be some imbrication lines up in this area that we see. Probably one of the biggest features that I see is, is the gingival embrasure is very full here. And the interproximal contact, as you see here, extends right almost from the middle third up through the incisal third. That's very thick. And in an ideal situation, we would expect that the incisal contacts would be uh, on the central incisors, would be up in the incisal one third and then gradually go lower. So this might be the result of there was too much space between the anterior teeth or the central incisors, which is called a diastema. And in some cases, uh, dentists to camouflage that will alter the contours from ideal to be able to do that. It makes the teeth look a little fatter, but perhaps that's a better result uh, aesthetically than the space between the teeth or having a diastema. So all in all, something to consider, but if you can see that feature on it, then we've accomplished a big step towards you understanding how form and function of anatomy go together and what you're going to be learning to use and um, having developed your concept of ideal or your image of what an ideal central versus lateral versus canine should be pre-restoratively.